what that's what it's meant to look like, but uh, let's start. You can see half the next slide if you want to. So this, will that work? Nope, that didn't work. You get a sneak preview of what's coming next, you see. <laughs> okay, so we've got a couple of people drifting in the back there. I'll just let them sit down. Um, this is a brief, sorry? Um, this is going to be a quick summary of the work that I did at the British Library, um, which was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, whose logo is up in the corner there. And there we go. The, the HRC is one of the UK's research councils. They predominantly fund academic research projects. Almost every PhD student or major research project in the UK is funded by one of these research councils or by an external grant making body. As their name suggests, they focus on the arts and the humanities. And one of the things they were very interested in was ways to support essentially their research projects wanting to work with Wikipedia in some way. So traditionally our focus has been on either GLAMs, going direct to cultural institutions and saying, hey, let's do stuff with you, or in academia going and working with teaching programs, using Wikipedia as a teaching tool or in student courses. This would be going to the, the larger research programs, the ones that don't necessarily involve a teaching element, but do want to involve some kind of public outreach, some kind of public dissemination of their work. And at the library, we did traditional glam work. There are people here talking extensively about things we've done with cultural institutions, and I think you've all heard a lot about that by now, so I won't go into it in much detail. We ran a skills program, which was essentially training in Wikipedia, how to edit it, how to contribute. And that was about 50 workshops for a total of 400 people who came to those. So really quite well attended, really quite popular. About a third of those were librarians, about a third of those were researchers or academics, and a third of those were just the general public. And then we did some project-specific work. So we actually went out to existing research projects and said, look, what can we do? What do you want to do? What do you want to try and work with Wikipedia for? And we ran sessions for them, but we also tried to figure out and get an understanding of what kind of work was practical with these programs. So the project outcomes were a report, which we won't go into here because it's incredibly dull. Um, there were a series of case studies and podcasts. So if you want to hear the podcasts and hear me talking about Wikipedia, which is in fact what you're getting just now, but different, if you want to hear them at your leisure, you can look on my user page, user Andrew Gray on NWiki, and there's some links there. And we also produced a set of uh, guidance for projects. So the idea being that rather than have myself in post going and talking to people, my post was going to end after a year, we'd write something that they could refer back to and say, we want to do this, we want to do, it, do this ourselves, what do we need to know, how do we get started, where do we go from here? And as part of that guidance, we tried to build essentially a a taxonomy and a set of concepts of how these research programs work and how they would want to work with Wikipedia. So we came up with five types of collaboration. Um, these were contextualization and contextualization is the idea of saying, well, our project is very specialized. It's probably going to represent a very, very small bit of human knowledge, it's obviously of great value, great academic value, but to the general public, kind of narrow, kind of not, maybe not very interesting to the public. But if they read about it, they want to know, they want to understand it, they want to know where it fits, um, they, will, they will try and read around the topic to get some idea of where this fits in the grand scheme of, of the world, and Wikipedia is a way of providing that contextual information. You write about the stuff that surrounds your project, people will understand your project better as a result. We looked at capturing research, which is the idea that major projects, especially in the humanities, especially historically oriented projects, do a lot of sort of secondary research. Your big outcome might be to produce uh, a history of a certain person or a certain place. But to do this, you have to research 20 or 30 or 40 different things to try and build up little bits of this overall picture. These small bits of research may never get published. They may never see the light of day. You may never do anything with them. Um, from the librarian's perspective, speaking as someone who spent a year cataloging, 
um, a cataloger will often find that you spend two hours figuring out if two authors were actually the same person and what they did, and then think, great, that has become one line in an entry that no one is ever going to look at again other than me. What can I do with this information? Nothing. I'm going to go have a cup of tea now. Um, so Wikipedia offers an opportunity to actually say, well, hold on, I've figured out this particular detail. I'm going to just record that for future. Someone else is going to want to know that. They're not going to be for four years, and they're going to be sitting in Indianapolis, and I'll never know about their existence, but I'll have answered their question. It'll be great. And research is a thousand of these small details. We can use Wikipedia to capture these small details and make them available for the world. We looked at content dissemination as well, which is more in keeping with the traditional glam work that we do, where you take material you've produced and you try and you know, you stick it on commons or you send it out to the world, you try and get it into new hands. We looked at exposing resources. So a lot of projects produce a digital, a website in some form or a digital database or a, an online resource of some kind and ways to make that resource available to the world, easily accessible and even if it's not, quote, open content, unquote, it's still of value to Wikipedia in that People can get at it. Once Wikipedians can get at it, they will do something transformative with it. They will make better things building on the stuff you've exposed to them. And this is particularly of value for projects that are producing something new. So the projects that are producing dictionaries of languages that don't have dictionaries yet, this sort of material is invaluable. And finally, we talked about student projects. So these are our, what you might call traditional educational programs, um, working with students to help do something around your research program, especially if you've got a lot of students working for you anyway, because you're an academic, you may as well get something useful out of them. Won't talk about that in too much detail because we know about these. So we focused on a few case studies. So the first of these is the, the Dunhuang project. I mentioned this when I was writing my slides yesterday and someone got very excited, I don't know if they're here or not. Um, the International Dunhuang project is a large international archeological project headquartered at the British Library. Um, I believe they have centers in 10 or 12 countries, which is focused around the archaeology of Silk Road sites in north, northwestern China and Tibet. So all these sort of ruined 10th century sites in the desert, preserved forever. And this is really quite specialist stuff, especially in the West. The number of people who are au fait with 10th century Buddhist history, pretty small. Um, and we realized that if we were to start writing it, other than some of the headline material, the Diamond Sutra, this sort of material, a lot of the material they produce is really specialist. It's not going to have a wide public impact or a wide public interest. Writing Wikipedia articles about it is not going to get a wide audience. However, if you were to focus on the overall context, you are going to get a wider audience. You are going to produce a more, something that will have more public value. So we looked at things like um, writing about archaeological sites. So these sites, these particular monuments, the material produced from them, we wrote about the expeditions that recovered this material, and we looked at things like the articles on languages or on archaeological techniques and classes of artifacts. So again, one step beyond, or one step back from the material that they had in hand, still valuable, still interesting, and helped people understand the work they were doing better. In order to do this, we ran a a single large-scale event in London, which ran for four days. We had events on all four days. We brought in Wikipedia volunteers. We brought in external academics. And we brought in student groups. I think we had about 30 students visit from groups at University College London and School of Oriental and African Studies. And we also had participation from the researchers, from the archaeologists themselves, writing about this material. The second large project we worked on was at the British Library, the Canadian Copyright Collection, which was a large deposited material there of, um, a large collection deposit there of material that was deposited for copyright in Canada in the late 19th century. For very complicated reasons, this ended up in London. Um, and the only time this has been studied in the past 100 years or so is when the current curator wrote his PhD thesis on it. That's it as far as we can tell. It was catalogued once, and a PhD thesis was written, and that was it. So we looked at um, Wikipedia almost as a way to stimulate some further research. 
Um, we got funding for digitization program, partly funded by Wikimedia UK and partly by the Eccles Center for American Studies, and used this to stimulate some research, stimulate some cataloging work, some, or some recataloging work, and some examination of the content. Um, we put it up on Commons. It's actually still being put up. There's about 5,000 images there. It's taken quite a while. And once we got the community involvement in figuring out what we actually have, this became invaluable. Because we started off with the labels that were given by someone in Toronto in 1902 who posted it in, and it just said, street scene. That's it. The community involvement can actually tell us where this place is, what's being shown, why this might actually be interesting. We know that most of these pictures must be interesting in some ways because if you copyrighted them, you wanted to sell them. They're not just snapshots. They have some value, even if we don't know what that value is. And we could then take this data and feed it back into the existing catalogs. So we use this as an example of content dissemination, a way of get, putting material out and actually getting value back, getting research information back just through the process of giving stuff away. And these are the pictures. In case you're wondering, this is the obligatory cat photograph. Um, this is one of our big open questions. Someone deposited and paid to copyright 12 pictures of cats sitting on books. We assume they wanted to do something with them, but we've never been able to trace who this person was, why they were doing it, what on earth they thought they were doing, or how they got the cats to stay still long enough. I'm a little worried by that. Uh, the other pictures are respectively a whale, a Cree Indian, um, the 1902 Stanley Cup winning team, and a ballroom. I don't know. And the, finally, the third case study was uh, the Darwin Project. The Darwin Correspondent Project at the University of Cambridge looks at building an online edition of the works of Charles Darwin, or the letters of Charles Darwin. And as part of this, builds a network of all of his correspondence, who wrote to who, wrote to who, when, and which letters they got, and which letters they got back, and what we know about them. And to do this, built short capsule biographies, of every, sorry, short biographies of every single person involved. Many of these people turn out to be very interesting. They were moderately well-known at the time, but they're now pretty much forgotten. And if these just sit in the index, they're not really going to be seen by people. So we looked at capturing these and making Wikipedia articles out of them. We focused in particular on 19th century women in science. Many of these women never formally published, but they were active in the sort of the informal scientific society at the time. We ran a public event. We got in about a dozen researchers, wrote a load of articles. Some of these very very interesting figures. We had uh, an article on the woman who reintroduced silkworm cultivation to Britain. Apparently, on a whim one day, she saw some silkworms in Italy and brought them home, as you do. And this is, I think, one of the most valuable ways of dealing with research projects is this sort of incidentally produced information. We can capture it, we can get it onto Wikipedia. It's very valuable in that sense, but traditionally, it's not been seen as very important. It's the stuff you do to get to your results. The project is producing this information anyway. It doesn't cost them, metaphorically speaking, very much to work on it. And they can reach out, collaborate with external communities. They can, make, they can put something out there and have the basis for someone else to work on in the future and potentially feed more information back into their own systems. So if they're building an index of these minor secondary figures, transfer it to Wikipedia, come back in two years and see if you have a more valuable index as a result. And it's not just Wikipedia. We can look at this collaborative, we can look at this capturing model. For example, if you are scanning a load of material to try and get something for your research, dump those scans on commons. You know, get them out there, make them available. You can look at saying, well, if you're transcribing a load of documents, um, I spoke to someone recently who was transcribing historical laws for a project of his. And if you're transcribing these anyway, well, stick them on Wikisource, we can use them there. So we have these various projects, we offer different ways of capturing information that might otherwise just languish in a filing cabinet forever. And the guidance documents basically say everything I've just said here. Uh, they're at WP colon AHRC, um, very informal, aimed at the research audience, about 5,000 words long. They give the general principles of what we're trying to do on Wikipedia and what we're not trying to do. They are focused on the English Wikipedia because that's what we got questions about. 
um, the, the interest in working was overwhelming with English Wikipedia, so we chose to focus the, the documents on that. They give first steps. How do you start a project? How do you go about you know, going from I want to do this to I'm actually doing this? We give a few examples and case studies, uh, both the ones we worked on in this project and some past ones by various people around the world. And we do give some summaries of what you can do outside the English Wikipedia, so what you can do in other languages, what you can do on Commons or with Wikisource or with Wikidata. And part of the focus of this is on identifying what will be a common problem. So for example, people who have copyright issues spot that early, say, look, if this is going to stop this project working, you want to know about that on day one. You don't want to know about it after two months. And I think this, this almost this sort of negative blocker approach is something we shy away from in some of our outreach material, but it can be important to say, look, you are going to have to make two or three hard decisions now, make those decisions, and then we can figure out what to do. So, I've run through this quite quickly because this is the end of the day and we want to get out quite fast, but we've got about five, 10 minutes for questions if anyone wants to, wants to ask anything. These are the links, the guidance documents there, which went up earlier in the week, the, the overall British Library project, and if you want to contact me, there's my contact details. Any questions? Phoebe. Pretty much, yeah. Sorry, I think the digital humanities are an interesting group because there's there's this very strong digital humanities community, and I think there's this, there's this strong sense that they would like to do something, and they know that there is this valuable resource there. But there's there's this gap. We've been traditionally focusing on different organisations, and this is maybe a new a new angle to be looking at. Do we have? Especially what you said about if you're transcribing anyway, if yes. you're doing this work anyway, then you know it doesn't it doesn't cost too much to put more things on Wiki Project. Denny, another thing I just wanted to mention, it's not really a question, is I was giving a keynote talk at a Arts, Humanities, and Complex Networks conference in Denmark this year. And they were really interested in things like what we're doing with Wikidata, what we have with connections with the Commons, where we have the connections to Wikipedia. And especially for the digital humanities here, mm. the interesting part is the fact that you actually have machine readable data about stuff that traditionally didn't have machine readable data before. And um, I really want to say thank you for this work and uh, for making these guidelines. And hopefully, uh, a lot of people will uh, follow them and actually add the data to the Wikimedia projects. The last, the very last workshop I did was in April, and it was basically titled Wikidata. It's coming, and it's going to be amazing, but I don't know very much about it yet. <laughs> and that was for the sort of London digital humanities type people. So it went down fairly well. Um, another project uh, that um, it's you know it's in between uh, the work with libraries and the work with authority uh, control uh, is a project we did with the, the National Library uh, of Italy and we actually put uh, on Wikidata their thesaurus, mm. which is not properly an authority control, but it can be regarded as. So uh, we actually linked every every term with the, the proper term on, on Wikipedia. So uh, right now uh, we can actually, you know, suggest in uh, Wikipedia pages, which are, you know, the preferred term, you know, you just give data to users. So I think that, is, uh, I, I think that th is the only thesaurus that is on Wikidata right now, but uh, I'm sure there right are, now. yeah, in English or uh, German. In future. Yeah, so, you know, we didn't think about it until they asked us, yeah, can we put this on Wikipedia? And we say, yeah, you can do that, so. Any, anyone else? I'm 
I'm wondering how you dealt with notability, especially for things like the Darwin Papers, where I imagine a lot of those people are barely notable by we, current standards. We had quite interesting. Um, we mentioned, for those of you who were at the, um, the, the coolest projects list earlier today, we talked about the, or Logic talked about the Royal Society event for Women in Science. And that event, we actually, I sat down a week beforehand with this enormous list of possible figures and went through them all figuring out who was notable. And that was really tough, but it proved really effective. When we did the Darwin project, we did the same thing. I said, I talked to the researchers a few weeks in advance and said, look, do you have a list of suggested names? They gave me about 20, 25 names. And we were able to quickly say, well, these, these 10 are definitely notable by Wikipedia standards. These six almost certainly aren't. The rest we're not sure about. And so we were able to say, well, look, let's, let's prioritize the ones that we know are notable, that we are really confident about. And we did bring up notability in the guidance, saying this is something that might prove a blocker, or it might prove a blocker to part of your project. And certainly, if your project relies on getting everything out there, it's almost certainly going to be a problem. And I mean, I think what's interesting about that to me is that those six people and the people you're unsure about are notable in terms of authority files. Yes. Uh, to bring it back to our previous discussion, those people could and should have authority entries. Yes. And maybe they should have entries on Wikidata. I've never, I'm not sure about that part, right? And so we have to decide. I, I think this is community. one of the big, the big looming questions of Wikidata is what's actually going to be in it. Is it going to be everything? everything. Yes. He doesn't like that. <laughs> so pers personally, I'm an inclusionist, but I mean, it's up to the community to decide. So I I'm sure we'll be having this discussion next year in London as well. Um, I thought I could add a couple of words about the digital humanities community. I've had occasion to work with some digital humanities hackers, and I, a lot of them are interested in a level of granularity that is different from what we do. They think about critical editions of texts where they care about the 27 versions, some of them partial, of a 13th century text, what they call witnesses. And they care about which version had a deleted word and which version had something in the margin. And they create critical editions on computers using a super crazy XML uh, language called dialect called TEI, which is almost as crazy as Wikitext. It's kind of a, um, and has terrible problems with overlapping and don't ask. Anyway, so th they, that's a different kind of product than a general interest encyclopedia. Uh, and a lot of the digital humanities work that I'm aware of is around that kind of work, that kind of super exact scientific transcription, which is not what we do. However, I think an opportunity exists with digital humanities around a related field, which is annotation. So the next step after you have a critical edition, or some, very often as you prepare the critical edition, is to prepare layers of annotation, very often multiple layers of annotation. So you annotate, I don't know, difficult words, but you also annotate biographical information of, of correspondence, etc. And you have uh, an, an apparatus criticus, and you know, it's, and that, of course, is very, very close to what we do, and is, first of all, a consumer of Wikipedia information, and Wikisource information and Wikidata for sure, and Commons. Uh, but ultimately, there, there, there is an opportunity there to create partnerships with those scholars. As you said, as they are generating that paragraph of information about a person, yeah. that needs to feed back into our projects. Even if all you've done is figure out that actually this person lived in Milan and not Florence, right. great. Right, or that these two different persons are one or vice versa or that the pseudonym belongs to a certain person, to go back to our earlier discussion. One last question, I think, before we're about to get thrown out. 
I can agree more with Azaf about uh, this thing be because uh, we actually had a literal project, it was a, actually a test project with a researcher from the Perseus project which uh, he was going to study editions of uh, um, Italian translation of, of uh, Greek uh, um, texts. And uh, he actually needed, you know, uh, crowdsourcing for, you know, uh, transcription, but the community couldn't keep up uh, about the work, you know, he, was, he wanted to do. So actually that was a failure. And um, the software isn't ready, and isn't ready is an euphemism. Um, it's not ready just because of Wikisource, because it just has, you know, Wikisource has just proofread extension, which is buggy and it needs a lot of stuff. But also, it's not just a, um, a technical problem, which it is, but I think that we completely lack um, cross-wiki coordination, cross-wiki, co you know, collaboration, because uh, we don't have actually any place where to talk about this project, you know, integration of Wikidata, I think is moving a lot of these things because it's a new project, we all want to, to stay on that. And, uh, but um, I think that there is a enormous room for, you know, collaboration in this direction. Uh, well, we're, we're just about to close, so. In fact, today, a group of users, uh, mainly led by a, a, an Austrian uh, Wikipedia user, uh, decided to found a group, a, a meta group, uh, about uh, the politicians who were um, deputies in the parliament of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which became, because and, uh, he is looking for uh, all those biographies, which are slightly more than 3,000 biographies, so we are trying to cooperate in finding the sources and uh, um, through Wikidata, sharing the main data in order to be, you know, passed on on the various versions of Wikipedia. So that's yet another user, uh, uh, you know, another use of Wikidata and possibly a, a pilot project. Okay, thank you all very much for coming along. Um, if you have any if you have any comments in the document, I'm more than happy to receive them and change it accordingly. Um, it has been through an extensive beta reading process over the past couple of weeks. And thank you all very much and enjoy your evening. Thank you for everyone coming in this conference. So if any one of you will need to take the shuttle bus, you guys might better proceed to the place where you guys will gather and then take the shuttle bus back to your dorm. And the place you guys need to go to take the shuttle bus is the JCA foyer. The platform right upstairs. Yeah. That would be the place where you guys need to wait. And then people with our volunteers or and the organizers will bring you guys to the shuttle bus. Thank you guys for coming and good night.